Well, it might be a little delayed, but we are hoping that summertime shows up at some point in Canada, and that might have you thinking about patio season, having a little bit of fun. And so today in Hot Picks, we're focused on those sin stocks, smoking and alcohol. Vivian Azur, Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst at TD Cowan, joins us now for her Hot Picks in these so-called sin stocks. Uh, everything in moderation, right, Vivian? Uh, Absolutely. Let's, let's get right into it. Philip Moore. Morris, uh, of course, known as a cigarette company, but is in the middle of a really big transition and a shakeup. We talk about the electrification of cars. There's also the electrification of cigarettes. Absolutely, yes. So they are the market share leader in what is called heat not burn technology. So different than an e-cigarette, the, the, the device relies on regular tobacco leaf. It comes in um, a cigarette type form and the device heats rather than burns um, the tobacco and by virtue of not combusting uh, the tobacco leaf, you avoid the formation of harmful constituents. The non-cigarette part of the business accounted for 35% of revenues in the first quarter. That was uh, certainly helped by the recent acquisition of Swedish Match in the United States, um, given their market share leadership in the modern oral tobacco category as well. But really nice runway for the company in terms of the, the ICOS portfolio, where they're launching new technology um, into Europe uh, this year, and they expect uh, volume growth for ICOS in 2023 to exceed the growth that they saw in 20. 2022. Can we just spend a beat on what have been the smoking trends generally, particularly in North America, and to what extent is the growth in e-cigarettes able to offset that or counteract that? So cigarette industry volumes in the United States have been quite challenged. Um, the reality is that the 2020 year one of COVID um, offered consumers, in particular lower income consumers, some incremental discretionary income that they were able to deploy against the cigarette category. And as a result, while cigarette industry volumes usually declined about mid single digits, in 2020 volumes were flat. So subsequently, you had very tough comparisons. And so you saw volumes decline five and a half percent in 2021 and eight percent percent in 2022. At Ultra's recent analyst day back in late March, they did note some degradation in price elasticities in U.S. cigarettes, and they're now modeling for minus 0.35. It had been minus 0.3 for the prior two decades. We do think that that's a reflection of pressure on the low-income consumer, because in addition to outsized volume declines, persisting in the category in 2023, we're also seeing down trading to deep discount and discounted mm. price to Okay. And uh, your, your, your price target, though, suggests some upside, $120 versus where we are right now, 97 uh, We don't often think about Pepsi as a sin stock, although I guess you can't really drink soda these days. <laughs> Um, and they have dabbled in alcohol uh, through partnerships. How are you thinking about Pepsi in this lens? So for, for us, the salty snack piece of the portfolio is the most important. Uh, the company has roughly a 60% share in U.S. salty snacks. They are the market leader in that category. The consumer is really raced um, salty snacks like Doritos um, and Fritos and, and Lay's and Ruffles, all of which sit in the Pepsi um, portfolio, really embrace those indulgent uh, treats in the, the pandemic. Um, and we haven't really seen a change in consumer behavior. Now, Pepsi, like many of its peers, is contended with pretty significant um, cost inflation, both you know in terms of underlying raw materials as well as in labor. But they've been very effective in passing along pricing in the U.S. salty snack category, and you really haven't seen any volume degradation. Uh, so consumers clearly are showing a willingness to absorb that pricing and stay in the category. And that should generate very durable earnings growth for Pepsi. And lastly, uh, Brown Foreman, I guess a little bit more traditional in the alcohol space, especially whiskey, which I feel like is experiencing a, a bit of a resurgence, especially in kind of that alternative investment category, people, you know, buying whiskey as an investment. So Brown Foreman is, uh, to your point, uh, the, the U.S. market share leader uh, in American whiskey, uh, led by the Jack Daniels brand. They also have a very strong uh, premium offering in Woodford Reserve, which continues to grow double digits. The reality is that the whiskey renaissance has been in place since 2011, and Brown Foreman was 
critical in driving that consumer mix shift, and it was really um, initiated with the introduction of Jack Daniel's Tennessee Honey. We had been in a 35-year um, growth cycle in vodka prior to that, from 1975 to 2010. So um, bourbon has been consistently gaining share at the expense of vodka. That drives very healthy growth for Brown Foreman in the United States, which accounts for about 50% of the company's revenues. But the international opportunity really is not to be understated. American whiskey is very underdeveloped in international markets, and in particular in emerging markets. And that's a huge opportunity for Brown Foreman because uh, the awareness of the Jack Daniels franchise um, is very, very high globally.